So hello, my name is Jules Brakman and I'm Vice President Research and Development for Flan Health. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about antimicrobial resistance. Now, during the presentation, I will be talking about the impact of antimicrobial resistance on topical treatment selection. So let's start with what antimicrobial resistance really is. It's the ability of a microorganism to survive and replicate during a treatment with a specific antibiotic or antiseptic. And how it works is depicted in the graph on the right side. In a wound, you have different germs. Some of them, they can be drug resistant, other ones can be quite sensitive. So what happens is when you treat these infections with an antibiotic or an antimicrobial agent, you will kill the sensitive bacteria or yeast or fungi, but what remains is basically a resistant strain. And this drug resistant strain can then grow and take over this infection, but also has the ability to give this drug resistant gene to other bacteria. And this failure to resolve this infection may mean that the infection spreads or becomes more severe. And as you have seen in the example, antimicrobial resistance can be facilitated by the inappropriate use of these antimicrobial agents, and as we will also discuss in the next couple of slides. Now, antimicrobial resistance has severe economic and health-related impact. We have around 700,000 people dying every year due to infections caused by antimicrobial resistant strains. And it's estimated that if we fail to address this problem in the near future, we will have around 10 million deaths annually by 2050. Just to put this in perspective, this is one person dying every three seconds. Now this, besides this health aspect and additional people dying due to antimicrobial resistance, it will also cost an additional, additional 66 trillion pounds of additional healthcare costs. Now, antimicrobial resistance can also be a problem in treating wounds, in wounds at risk of infection or wounds which have been infected. And the, simple for that is quite, the reason for that is quite straightforward. With any wound, you have a loss of skin integrity. So what you have is a moist, warm, nutrient-rich environment which is prone to microbial colonization and prone to proliferation of different types of strains. And as you have seen in the previous slides, these, some, most of these strains will be sensitive, but some of them can also be resistant to different antimicrobial agents. So when you then inappropriately use antimicrobials or you use it in a wrong way, you risk of selecting resistant strains. And the risk of selecting a resistant strain always is coupled to a non-healing wound, which will, in the end, increase your treatment time, but also increase the resources needed to treat your infection, and in eventually could lead to risk for life-threatening complications. Now, if you want to find out more about this risk, I would really welcome you to go to the uh, Yuma document on antimicrobial resistance and non-healing wounds, as well as documentation provided by the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. And due to that risk of antimicrobial resistance being present in wound management, it's indicated that proper regimens for managing infection and antimicrobial stewardship programs are really central in decreasing the spread of infections caused by multidrug resistant microorganisms. Now, luckily, and as you all know, different antimicrobial stewardship programs are being undertaken in different healthcare facilities. You have advisory committees overseeing the prudent use of antimicrobials. And we have a lot of national guidance and international education and information programs that are being produced and are out there to increase also the knowledge on EMR and antimicrobial stewardship. But every one of these antimicrobial stewardship programs and regimens for managing infection, they're multifactorial. On one side, they, you need to optimize the wound healing environment. 
On the other side, you also have to avoid prescribing antimicrobials when they are not indicated. Now, unfortunately, when you have a wound at risk of infection or a wound which is infected, you need to use an antimicrobial therapy. And under these circumstances, it's of the utmost importance to use a correct regimen, but also to optimally use an agent that has the least risk of adverse effects for the patient and for the community. More specifically in this context, looking at a potential risk that this antimicrobial agent could have on the level of cytotoxicity, systemic toxicity, or the risk towards development of antimicrobial resistant strains. Now, how can you now assess this, this risk of antimicrobial resistance? Well, typically there are two ways to do this. The first one is that you look at the emergence of clinically isolated resistant strains. And then it's quite logic that the more frequently an agent is used, the greater the opportunity that you will select for resistant mutants and for transmission to susceptible individuals. This is always something that you have to take into account when assessing this aspect. Now, the second way to look at the risk of antimicrobial resistant development is try to induce this resistance in the lab with in vitro experiments. Now, how does this look like? I will show you and is basically also depicted in the graph on the right. What you basically do is you take a strain, whether it's a gram positive strain or a gram negative bacteria or a yeast or a fungi, you can do it with any one of them. You grow them, you culture them, and then you expose these strains to different concentrations of an antimicrobial agent. And you measure the concentration which is needed to kill that microorganism. For example, 1% of an antimicrobial agent. The strains that do survive treatment, you basically reculture them again in a second cycle and you expose them again to a different concentration range of antimicrobial agents. And you measure again the minimal concentration or MIC, which is needed to kill these microorganisms. And at the moment that you see resistance being developed, you basically see that the concentration that you initially needed will be much lower and that the concentration that you now need will be much higher. So when at the start of your first culture, you maybe only needed 1% of an antimicrobial agent, when your strains are becoming resistant, you maybe need 5 to 10% or even more to still get the same killing. And this is really an indication of resistance being developed towards an antimicrobial treatment. Now, the Yuma document on antimicrobials and non-healing wounds basically lists this risk and gives a lot of advice and guidance on what this means for different antibiotics, such as silver, so for silver sulfadiazine, real topical antibiotics like bacitracine and fusidic acid, antiseptics like iodine, chlorhexidine and polyhexanide, and it also mentions our GLG enzyme system, which we use in Flaminol under the other antimicrobial agents. Now, when you then look at this potential risk of cytotoxicity and systemic toxicity and this risk of resistance being developed, you can clearly see that for a lot of the antibiotics and antiseptics that are being used in wound care, like silver nanoparticles, topical antibiotics like fusidic acid, chlorhexidine, iodine, you see that publications are out there that indicate that resistant bacteria have been isolated after treatment. Different strains, whether they're gram positive, like, Pseudomonas, uh, like Staphylococcus aureus, or gram negative, like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And for a lot of these antibiotics and antiseptics, also in vitro resistant development profiles have been investigated. And identically, also here, for lots of, lots of these antibiotics and antiseptics, you do see that you can induce resistance when you subculture them time after time and expose them to different antimicrobial agents. Now, during the presentation, I will focus mainly on the results that we obtained for our GLG enzyme system. And as you all know, 
the GLG enzyme system at the moment has no resistant bacteria isolated or being published. We also know that the potential for cytotoxicity, whether it's systemic or cytotoxicity as such, is low to non-existing. But what this document of Yuma doesn't describe is can you induce resistance towards GLG as you can do with other antibiotics and antiseptics. And this was something that we also investigated in our labs. Now, before I go into these details, I would just briefly uh, explain again how this antimicrobial activity works of this GLG enzyme system. The enzyme system consists of three parts, a glucose oxidase, a lactopyroxidase, and a guayacol. And in the presence of air, so oxygen and water, glucose oxidase catalyzes the oxidation of glucose to gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide. And it's then that second part, the lactopyroxidase, together with the catalytic anion, that will oxidize this further to hypoiodide, which we call a reactive oxygen species. And these reactive oxygen species are then stabilized by guayacol, the third part of our GLG enzyme system. And it's this reactive oxygen species mixture that will result in selective destruction of a microbial cell wall. Now, our data has shown that this GLG enzyme system has a high antimicrobial activity. It has an antimicrobial activity against different gram-positive strains like Staph aureus, like Enterococcus species, and different gram-negative strains like Pseudomonas, Enterococcus and Burkholderia, just to name a few. But it also has a high antimicrobial activity against yeast such as Candida and Fungi, just such as Aspergillus. And what is really important is that it also has an antibiofilm activity. As you can see here on this slide, what it shows you is a starting biofilm on the bottom and a mature biofilm on the top. The top one is a Staph aureus, the bottom one is a Pseudomonas aeruginosa biofilm. On the left side, you see the biofilm before treatment and you see that if we stain them with a live death staining, all the bacteria or most of them are stained green, which means that they're alive. On the right side, you see the same biofilm when we treat it with our GLG enzyme system. And you can clearly see that on the top part, most of the cells are dead. They're stained red. And the biofilm has been, which was a mature biofilm, has been disrupted. While on the bottom part, you can clearly see that the biofilm cells are also dead. They're stained red but it also prevented new biofilms of being formed. So this clearly shows that our GLG enzyme system not only has a clear activity, antimicrobial activity, against planktonic cells, but also against biofilm cells, which is highly relevant specifically for uh, wounds of risk of infection or wounds that have been infected. Now, besides having this antimicrobial activity, it doesn't have any cytotoxicity towards skin cells, as you can see here on these slides. On the top, you can see results for fibroblast. On the bottom, you see the results for keratinocytes, two different cell types that are present within skin. And what this shows you, these graphs are growth of these cell lines. Growth when they're exposed just to water on the left, or when they are, are exposed to our GLG enzyme system. And you can clearly see that whether it's water or GLG, our cells are happily growing. In contrast, you can also see that when you expose these same cell lines to other antimicrobial agents, you can clearly see that their growth is inhibited. But I wasn't here really to talk about the cytotoxicity or the antimicrobial activity per se. I will promise you to show you more results on whether resistance can be induced towards this GLG antimicrobial system. So if you keep in mind the test that I explained in the previous slides, which was basically we take Staph aureus, Pseudomonas or Candida, we grow them and we expose them to different concentrations of our GLG system. We measure 
the MIC, the minimum concentration which is needed to kill these bacteria. And the remaining cells, the few remaining cells that are still present, we grow them again and we expose them again to our GLG system. Now we have done this now already over 100 times, consecutive growth cultures, subculturing and exposing Staph aureus, Pseudomonas and Candida to our GLG system. And what you can see on the graph on the left side is that the concentration needed to kill these bacteria doesn't change. It doesn't change whether you treat these bacteria 10 times or whether you treat them 100 times in a row. Which is an indication that at least under the conditions of this test, we are not able to induce resistance towards our GLG enzyme system. Now, just as a comparison, we did the same test, and this is also explained in an article of Panacek that was published in Nature Nanotechnology, and this is what you see on the right side. We did this also with silver. And we exposed E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa to silver nanoparticles, the remaining cells. We grew them again and we exposed them a second time. And we kept on repeating this for several times in a row. And what we saw was that, for example, E. coli or Pseudomonas, they already develop resistance towards these silver nanoparticles very quickly, already after five or 10 subculturing cycles. Bear in mind, these tests are identically performed as what we did with the GLG system. So what it shows that under these conditions and in vitro, the sensitivity of bacteria towards the GLG enzyme system as such, or in Flaminol, remains the same over time, even after 100 exposure cycles. Whereas the sensitivity to silver nanoparticles under the same conditions of the test already reduce uh, after five applications and dressing changes. Now we didn't want to stop there because this is basically an endpoint measurement. What we wanted to know is also are these bacteria changing their behavior when they're exposed to this GLG enzyme system. So we cultured these bacteria again and we left them untreated. We left them untreated but we grew them 100 times in a row. We exposed them to one application of our GLG system or we repeatedly exposed them for, for example, 100 times towards our GLG enzyme system. We extracted the RNA in each of these conditions and we, sequenced, we prepared sequencing libraries. And what this showed us or what this enabled us is to look at which genes are up or down regulated under which condition. Because you would imagine that under certain conditions of antimicrobial resistance, your strains are behaving differently or will start to behave differently. And this is what you can see on the right side, this Venn diagram, is basically it shows you the amount of genes that are differently up or down regulated when the strains are growing as such, no treatment, or when they are exposed to one treatment of GLG or different treatments of our GLG enzyme system. Now these are the details. What is really important out of this research, that came out of this research, was that it indicated that we don't really see any significant phenotypic or genotypic changes which can be linked to potential antimicrobial resistance development. Whether it was growth rate, whether it was looking at genes involved in persisters or biofilm formation, there was no clear indication of antimicrobial resistance also being developed on a genetic level. So these tests, they validated what we also observed in our initial test. It's very difficult to make a bacteria resistant towards our GLG enzyme system. So by conducting these tests, we were very happy to be able to close this remaining gap, which was still present in this table. We now know that our GLG enzyme system, that's still so far, there are no resistant bacteria isolated from cultures. And that also under lab tests, we are not able to induce real resistance towards this GLG enzyme system. While on contrast, we do know that for a lot of antibiotics, a lot of antiseptics, 
resistant bacteria have been isolated. We also know that for a lot of these antibiotics and antiseptics, when you use them in a lab setting, you can easily and quickly induce antimicrobial resistance. And what was really nice to see was that this GLG enzyme system that we use in Flaminal has this safety profile not only when it comes down to antimicrobial resistance development or the risk towards antimicrobial resistance development, but that it also doesn't pose any cytotoxicity, that it has no systemic toxicity when it comes down to being used on skin cells. So the take-home message that I wanted to give with this presentation is that AMR, or antimicrobial resistance development, is a risk also in wound management. When you're looking at wounds at risk of infection or wounds that are infected. And for that reason, it's really central to have regimens for managing infection and antimicrobial stewardship programs in place. Now, luckily, as all of you know, these are in place in several healthcare facilities. And there are several international education and information programs that are still being developed to increase that knowledge. And I would welcome you to also go to the new early e-learning course on antimicrobial stewardship put together by Yuma and the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. But it's of the utmost importance to take into account that this needs to be a multifactorial approach. On one hand, you have to use the agents which can provide an optimal wound healing environment, not only taking into, into account the antimicrobial aspect, but also the wound environment aspect. And if it's not needed, you need to avoid as much as possible prescribing antimicrobials. Now, as you all know, when you have wounds at risk of infection or infected wounds, an antimicrobial therapy can be indicated. And under these conditions, and this is really what I hope to, that you get uh, home with, with this uh, presentation, is that you use a correct regimen. That optimally an agent is being used that has the least risk for adverse effects for the patients and for the community taking into account its potential for cytotoxicity or systemic toxicity and its potential to induce antimicrobial resistance. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you found it useful. If you want to find out more about Flaminol and how it works or see the evidence on safety and effectiveness, please visit the Flan Health website.